I'm sort of depressed about what's happening uh, in the world, Steve, on so many levels. But, you know, I was just quoting Frank Luntz as saying that uh, the choice is clear. You know who the two nominees are and 70 percent of Americans would rather it not be so. So let me just ask you, how the hell did we get in this position where the two people running for president, nobody's very excited about either of them? It's pretty extraordinary. One of the things that is hammered into the brains of the American people really through repetition on all of the cable shows is that the country is evenly divided down the middle. And, and the fact of the matter is on, on a lot of issues, it's not. And certainly on the political issue, right, that's the most important one, uh, you have 70% of the country, right? So that's, that's a lot of progressives. That's a lot of MAGA people, right? That's a lot of everybody who's looking, saying, no mas, time, time to move on. So you have a couple of colliding issues. You have a generation that's just not yielding executive power in a way that is the norm in the country's history. So, I mean, I, I thought, you know, it was astounding in 16 that we had a baby boomer election at some level. But, but then you say in 20, we have another one. Surely that's the last. In 24, we have, we have another. The reality is you have these two institutions, the first and the third oldest political party in the world, and they agree on something, right? They agree on a big thing. What they agree on is that this is the choice you're going to get, like it or not. And that and that choice, somewhere between 70 to as high as 80% of Americans are like, we don't want it. So it has an interesting effect on the coalition, and specifically Trump's coalition, right? Because Trump's coalition is a fanatical base plus indifference that's born out of apathy caused by a choice that nobody wants. And so it creates a very interesting dynamic as these two campaigns look to a rematch that last time was settled across three states by 40,000 votes. Well, I know that Frank also said this is going to be the worst election in modern history. I'm not quite sure what he meant by that. Do you? Well, I mean, I think it means a lot of things. I think that um, the intimations towards violence, uh, towards chaos, um, a campaign where your fellow citizens are routinely dehumanized, talked about as enemies, talked about as vermin, talked about as subhuman, there will be consequences for this. Uh, there always has been. Um, the language of political violence has always been followed by political violence. And so when you look ahead, uh, you consider that the leading Republican candidate, the presumptive nominee by any fair and historic definition after tonight, is running a campaign talking about mass incarcerations of millions of people through police state tactics to deport them. Um, when you look at somebody who's promising retribution, promising revenge, um, when we look at the Lincoln Memorial, right, it's, it's not there because it's aesthetically pleasing. Right. It's not it's not an, it's not an architectural accoutrement right on a on a parkland. Right. It, it's a temple, as is described above the memorial of Lincoln himself. But but the words on on both sides of him that flank him are about reconciliation. These are the high values. These are the noble ideals. And what's, what's, what's coming, what's confronting those noble ideals is something we've seen before in the country. It's menacing. It's frightening. 
Uh, it's a form of, a derivative of fascism of the 1930s. And, and it has to be contested. And so the ugliness that will come from that, the chaos that will come from that, uh, the turmoil that will explode in Chicago around the Democratic Convention because of the conflict in Israel and Gaza, is going to be very, very ugly. And it's going to be a very, very stressful year where the fundamental cornerstones of the country, of the American way of life, are constantly assailed and assaulted and sometimes uh, maybe not uh, really well defended in the estimates of a lot of people. So that's what I suspect he's talking about. Steve, why isn't Joe Biden doing better in the polls? If it, the account, obviously immigration has become a huge issue. I think it was the second most important. And now I believe it's moved into first place in many polls. But first, before we talk about immigration, the economy is doing well by all accounts, although the price of goods is still high. And I think that's people, that's what people think of when they wonder if the economy is doing well. But why do you think Biden is struggling so much? And we'll talk about the age thing separately. Well, well I think the first thing to understand is that 40% of the country doesn't have $400 for an emergency. You have, you have tens of millions of people that are unbanked. The, the overwhelming percentage of young enlisted men and women in the military who do their banking at the check cashing or payday lending storefront with usury rates is, is immense. Tremendous percentage of the country has massive health care debt, um, is, is, is one disaster away. Mm -hmm. um, prices and inflation, right, the correlation between what I make and what shit costs, right? Um, you, can, you can give a lot of statistical lectures, tell people how they ought to feel on it, but, but they know, right? And just like anybody who goes out in public, just kind of anecdotally, even if you're not really price sensitive or paying attention, it's hard not to, right? If you, if you, if you do any type of, of consumer spending at, at all. But at the core, the, the present, is a communications business. And, and, and unfairly or not, he has been washed over by a wave of vituperative propaganda, right-wing, uh, uh, antagonistic, untruthful, dishonest, disparaging, but they have not utilized the bully pulpit of the presidency in anywhere near close to its potential. And so a lot of times you will hear Democrats in Washington around the administration try to make comparisons to the president and say FDR. It falls flat for a lot of reasons, but the most significant one is the political genius of FDR as a communicator. And, and so this is a business that, like a rock show, when, when the E Street Band gets on the stage with Bruce Springsteen, right, the faithful want to hear the show, right? They want want to hear the poetry so and, is and there's it, no poetry in any of this and so there's that well i was going to say it's not only sort of the being drowned out by right-wing uh sources but also the fact that he has not done many press conferences interviews president biden isn't very visible well it's he is he, he is, he is in a situation constantly because of that invisibility when he appears, the stakes are raised through the roof. 
And so you have a couple of moments in a in a year, right? You, they threw right. away the Super Bowl opportunity. That was 100 million people, right? The next one is the State of the Union. After that is the convention speech. So, so there's no way to do this without communicating, without speaking, without engaging. Um, and, and the White House better figure this out quickly because at the core, the, the one promise that Biden made, right, that was deeply attached to the premise of the candidacy to his election was that we're going to move on from this craziness in the country. All right, we're going we're gonna to move past the extremism, right? And, and no matter how you judge that, right, like, I, I mean, as fairly and openly as you can, right, and, by, 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 and here's what I mean by that, right? If, if you have two political parties in the country and they're each other's opposition, and one of the two political parties has become a fascist party, right, the other party's job is to oppose it. So, so how is the measurement of success by outcome of that party if four years after the insurrection, right, the, the extremism is hotter, better funded, better organized, and winning? There's meaning behind that, right? And there's something that has to be said about that 245 days before it's too late to talk about it anymore. But what is he supposed to do to counter that? I mean, and what what should the Democratic Party do to counter that if, in fact, that is the situation as you laid it out? Well, I, I mean, what this election is about the American way of life. You have to be able to articulate uh, big and monumental events uh, to the society as a whole. Um, what's happening in the Middle East, in Europe, is monumental. These are monumental events. The Russians have sustained upwards of 400,000 casualties invading Ukraine. The, 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 what that means is they're deeply committed to the project and what comes next. There, there should be some ability to contextualize within a living lifetime of humanity's most significant event, the fact that the Russian dictator fully revealed is saying exactly about ethnic Russians what Adolf Hitler was talking about in 1936 and 1937 and 1938 with ethnic Germans. So, so this moment requires the Biden campaign, the Democratic Party, to summon an idealism, to communicate the values and ideas of the country, to unite us as Americans against a real threat, right? And that, that threat goes to the core of our freedoms, to the core of our liberty, to the core of a very deeply important idea on the edge of our 250th birthday. Are we all created equally or not, right? And there is an unwinding of this idea that we're literally watching play out in real time. Having said that, Steve, it seems like, and maybe it's the way it's communicated or the communicators that who are saying it, it doesn't feel that this threat to democracy, that these huge, you know, existential questions about the, the, you know, the United States and our values, for some reason, it doesn't seem to be permeating the national consciousness in a way perhaps people like you think it should. And it, um, why is that? Is it because we're so siloed and polarized and we're all developing our, you know, establish our own uh, media ecosystem and we're listening pe to people telling us what we want to hear? I mean, it, it just, I just, you know, we've heard these arguments and it's been written about if the Atlantic did a whole issue on what all these things that will happen if Donald Trump is reelected to freedom of the press, I mean, to a whole range of, of topics. 
So people are trying to make that argument, but some people just refuse to hear it. Well, let me let me give you two specific examples. Um, black woman in Ohio, 25 weeks pregnant, uh, five days short of the 26 week no abortion statute, has vaginal bleeding, goes to the emergency room. What does the hospital do, right? Do they share? They don't. Um, they convene an ethics committee. She sits there for eight hours, goes home. Next day, goes back to the hospital, goes home again. Third day, miscarries, uh, puts the remains of the fetus in the toilet. Though the tar charges have been dropped, she was prosecuted in the state of Ohio. Does that woman, does she live in a democracy? She doesn't live in a democracy. And we should stop kidding ourselves that she does. What if you live in Solano County, California, and a group of tech billionaires decide that they're going to build utopia, right, in your county where you've been on the land for five generations, right? And, and the whole gang comes in, all the Silicon Valley hotshots, right? They drive the prices through the roof. They disrupt the fabric of the community. Are you living in a democracy? You're not living in a democracy, right? So what Trump is at his core is a philosopher of fuck youism. And when expectations drop to a low enough point, when all, all hope is eroded, when people do not believe in any institution whatsoever, they have no expectation that anybody will do anything they say they do, what can they count on? Trump delivers every single day by antagonizing the people that scores of millions of Americans hold responsible for the dissolution of the way of life, the evaporation of their middle class existence. The fact that they feel like they're hanging on right by their by their fingertips and they're pissed about it. Right. And, and, and so Trump is like a sugar high. Right. Uh, like a fuck you, whether delivered on a on a turnpike. Right. With a middle finger. It is it is satisfying for a moment, maybe, but it's empty. It builds nothing. So the answer to this, right, can be found in what John Kennedy said, what Roosevelt said, what Truman said, right? The spine of the Democratic Party, right, is found in a working man's and working woman's party that's deeply connected to people getting a fair shot, being able to provide for themselves. You know, the, for Roosevelt talked about freedom of fear, freedom of want. Right. And, and all of these things should be reinvigorated in a new social compact at the edge of, a, of an era that's ending and a new one that's beginning. So, so what, what does a workforce look like in the age of AI? No one's talking about any of this stuff, in part because the overwhelming majority of political leaders in the country have many, 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 many more days behind them than they do ahead of them. So when you have a 43-year-old president like John Kennedy, he was looking up to the heavens, to the stars, imagining the era to come. And that, that, that is the energy that's vital in American politics. And we'll find our way to that again when we get through through um, this very sclerotic period of unhappiness. Steve, I want to ask you two questions or about two issues. One is immigration. Um, how do you see, I mean, obviously they had a bipartisan bill. They worked for five months to hammer it out. Um, it had some very harsh penalties for illegal immigrants and 
yet it never was brought to a vote uh, on, on, by the Senate or the House. And, um, you know, a lot of people are blaming Joe Biden for the number of immigrants, and now we're seeing them in cities that previously had not experienced that kind of influx. How do you see that playing out in this election? Well, this issue could cost Joe Biden the presidency. Um, and that's why this immigration deal got scuttled. Uh, you know, let's understand what the Republican position is, right? Which is that it's gotten worse on a three-year basis and we're not gonna save you in the last year. In fact, we're gonna do everything we can to make it worse, right? So we can blame you for it and run the election on it. And just the simple fact of the matter is, is that it wasn't the wall, it was COVID. But on the day that Biden became president, you know, the, the flow of immigration across the southern border was under control and it no longer is. And some number of millions of people have come into the country illegally. And you have Democratic mayors all over the country crying out for federal assistance, whether it's in New York, whether it's in Denver. And people see this in all of America's major cities and even secondary and tertiary cities with their own eyes and then become more antagonized when they're told by whatever cable news host that in fact, what they're seeing with their eyes is not in fact occurring at all. And all is, and all is good, right? So it's the political equivalent of being that passenger on the plane when it's not going anywhere and the captain won't say anything and they keep telling you 10 more minutes, 10 more minutes, 10 more minutes, right? So, so the political strategy, right, of denying the problem is provoking people. The second, the second part of this is that the architecture of the deal, right, you know, going back to the John McCain, Teddy Kennedy era, you know, going back to, you know, when I was in my 30s in politics and in my 40s in, in politics is that, the architecture of the deal was always imagined that we're going to secure the border. If you were one of the people who came across that border, which was basically an open border, you get to stay. You go to the back of whatever proverbial line there may be, which means you're eligible to become a citizen seven years after getting a green card, which at a minimum is 15 years off in the distance. But that was, and you pay a fine. That was the deal. There, there was no way around that deal. Now, there are some Republicans who said, looked at Democrats at the time and said, what's your guys' position on this, right? What, are you for a border at all, right? So we should be clear in the country that on both sides, right, you've seen the extremes play out and the consequence of an open border as it manifests itself here is we're going to go to a period of, of extremely low immigration into this country for decades. So we have the highest percentage of foreign born population in American history. And the last time it got to this point was about 1920. And there was literally no immigration into the country for about 40 years right, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a net total. The immigration that we celebrate the Statue of Liberty, you know, is something that, that existed through about 1920. And so the modern era of American immigration is coming to an end. Um, the restrictions will be severe. Uh, the nativism around this issue is immense. And until there is real economic growth where people are feeling like they're climbing the ladder. You're not going to see this issue loosen up. Uh, and it's going to get uglier. It's going to get meaner. Uh, it's going to get nastier. And at the end of the day, nobody, right, when you watch the news, right, I, I look at the news, you know, 20 years ago, there used to be coverage of what happens in the country south to our border. Um, they are like black holes in our culture and our society. 
And the fact of the matter is, if you're the most powerful country in the world and the most powerful in the hemisphere, and there's a lot of poor, politically unstable countries to your south, there's going to be a lot of net migration flow to the north over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And there's no honest discussion. There's no policy. There's no idea. And there's nobody talking about this issue in a, in a direct, honest, clear, non-demagogic way anywhere, anywhere. Which is so, so frustrating because it's complicated. I interviewed an immigration lawyer and the law itself is so complicated and convoluted uh it's it's really hard to kind of figure out a solution to the problem that makes sense and of course more funding is necessary and that was part of that bill that never was voted on in congress so you know when there is a potential solution it's more convenient for i think the republicans to weaponize the the issue and 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 they prefer doing that over solving the problem they if it it's not even that, right? They want to make the problem worse. You know, the political calculus is very clear, very direct, right? It's not hidden. You know, they are they are declaring we're going to make this problem worse. We're not going to pay any political price for making it worse. But we're going to benefit from it in our quest to take political power. Uh, it's it's astonishing to you know to look at it. You have a you have this is a legitimate national crisis and it's a humanitarian crisis for the people that are coming north from the people that make it into the country you know for the people that are sleeping under the overpasses right the the entire situation the political posturing by people like greg abbott um and the attorney general in texas um the assault on federal uh, law enforcement by Texas trying to seize control over a portion of the border. It, all of it is madness, right? And, and it is what it is. It is cynical. It is wrong. Um, and, and it is awful. And what, what Donald Trump is proposing, and I think it's like really important, right, for, for everybody who's watching, um, we are old enough to remember Elian Gonzalez and, and the shit show that ensued over his, his repatriation to Cuba. Everybody needs to contemplate and think deeply about what the society looks like when you have a federal government that says we're out to arrest some score of millions of people and deport them. This is the United States of America, not a police state. Roadblocks, checkpoints, what does that look like? Time to start talking about it. Because one of the things is true in this election, and one of the things you have asked about me earlier about what Biden should talk about. It's just it's a simple historic fact that there's nobody who has ever promised the retribution and the revenge that Trump is talking about, who when they got, got political power, hasn't delivered on, on the promise. Nobody. Steve, let me ask you, I, I, it, I feel like it's a broken record in the media, but that New York Times Siena College poll showed that 73% of voters believe that Joe Biden is too old to be an effective president, which is a pretty staggering percentage. By the way, I want to add that according to a, an AP poll, a similar but slightly smaller share, 57% believe Donald Trump lacks the memory and acuity for the job. But it seems like the too old moniker sticks much more on Joe Biden than it does on Donald Trump. And uh, I, I wonder what you think of this and is, you know, how does Joe Biden combat this feeling? And we talked about, you know, not being, 
not being available or not being so public in his appearances and then raising the stakes for when he is, right? But but what if you were advising the Biden administration, what would you tell them to do about this? I think um I think that they need to straighten their lines out. Because the one thing that you cannot do in a presidential campaign is contradict your core message and undermine it with actions. John McCain, Sarah Palin, perfect point. So I remember that. Right? Let's look at the Biden campaign. So what, what is it that they say? This is the most important election in American history. Everything is on the line. The democracy is on the line. Okay, that's great. I agree with that, by the way. But that's not the most important consideration in the election, though, is it? There's a higher, higher Trump card, so to speak. Higher face card. And it's Joe Biden's ego, isn't it? Right? Because the most important issue is the consideration not towards beating Trump, but towards the satisfaction of Joe Biden's ambition to serve a second term. So there are scores and scores of blind quotes in newspapers where Biden administration officials are talking about over the last three years is we want Trump to be the nominee. We want him to be. So Here's a question. What is Trump? Is Trump a threat or is Trump a prop? I think he's a threat. So I want him as far away from power as possible. And I think about as irresponsible a position as a person could have is the idea that you want to lure Trump forward because he represents, astonishingly, right, the mindset the easiest prey for Biden because Trump and the estimation of the Biden team is the only person who who can be beaten by Joe Biden, right? Joe Biden beats Trump. That's why Joe Biden's got to run. He is the monster slayer. Now, the problem along the along the way is that as it turns out right the the only democrat right judging by the polls that for sure right donald trump can beat is biden i mean he loses badly to a generic democrat and to everything else so 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 you have three quarters of the party every person joe scarborough says nobody comes on my show Nobody and ever, ever says out loud what they say when the camera's off. It's like, what's the word for that, right? When the journalists and the politicians have one conversation off camera and then the gaslighting conversation on camera, except the country kind of senses this and they see it and they feel gaslit and they feel bullshit. Right, and the and the consequences, this deep cynicism, all of it accrues in whose favor? It accrues in Donald Trump's favor, right? So, so what, what Joe Biden has to say, and and you can hold a gun to my head, I can't tell you why he's running for re-election, right? And and, and it, it's important to understand this. We don't throw ticker tape parades for our politicians in America for doing the things they said they would do to get elected. We gave you the plane. We gave you the helicopter, the White House, Camp David. That's all the shit. That's what you get. Right? You get the library. Right? They give the 21 gun salute. You have the Marine Band. Hail to the chief. That's it. That's so what do you thank you? But what are you what are you saying that he has not he has not been uh, specific enough in making the case I, of why he should be reelected? I am an eighty 81- one.
one year old man standing before you asking for four more years of power because of why? What urgent mission stands at hand? Why you? Why you? Right. And and this is core, right? And I and I've had, you know, you have this argument sometimes with people, right? And it's like, you know, um, you know, I, I've had this conversation with my wife. And she'll say, you know, well, he never said that he'd be a one-term president. And I said he was standing next to Cory Booker. And I asked Kamala Harris, about right? this. And, and I go, so, so what does that mean, right, as someone who's 53, right? What does that mean for, like, a Gen Xer, right, that, like, generationally we're ready, like, when Cory Booker 62? We should explain <laughs> that he said that in, in the presence of Gretchen Whitmer. Right. Uh, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker that he wanted to be a bridge to the next right. generation of leaders but during like the, the next, 2020 campaign. The next generation of leaders, as a practical matter, like Cory Booker in 2028 is going to be like 60 years old. Right? Like, like, like 60, I, I appreciate it being like the new 38. Right, but the idea that the next generation you're ready to hand it off is 60, no, no, right? And, but, and so, and so he has an urgent task now. State of the Union address, right? Gettysburg address lasted for like six minutes. Right? You get up there and probably talk for an hour and 15 minutes, 400 points of policy gibberish that nobody. We'll be able to remember any of twelve hours later, right? So, right that is, that is not predestined, right? Does it? They could rip up the speech tonight, say something consequential, say something important, read old speeches where president said important and consequential things in compelling ways. If you don't have original thoughts of your own, right? But, but, but this is a monumental moment. And in a monumental moment, Trump's deranged musings can't be met by what? Silence? No rebuttal? Right, we're above it? That Biden is somehow of a moral standing above Trump, so therefore being above Trump, he doesn't have to respond to Trump, we'll ignore him? So, so, so the handle on the race, what's the race about? How do you beat the man? How do you engage him? How but do you that, take the fight to Donald Trump every day? That's what the Biden campaign is falling short at right now. I'm sorry, interrupted. What doing every day? Taking the fight to Donald Trump every hour of every day, making the race about the future, one about Trump's risk to the country and to all the people in it at a, at a very intimate level. But is the state of the union the right venue to do that, Steve? He's got two speeches left where he has the ability to communicate to like big audiences numbering right in eight figures, right? In, you know, 20, 30 plus million people and every everyone who come out. Yeah, like the state of the union is not strong. It's not good. The State of the Union has not been consistently strong over our 248 years. Right? State of the Union is wretched. Right? And, and that fact doesn't mean it's a referendum on Biden's presidency. But, you know, the, the choice to walk out and to connect with the country, to meet the country where they are, as opposed to delivering poll-tested banalities and happy horseshit that, that no one believes in, that no one connects with, right, is not a strategy to win this election, right? right? And so, so right now, right, the, the, it's clear the Biden administration, they're dabbling out, whether it's to Axios, whether it's to New Yorker, right, they're giving access to select reporters to come in, spend time with Biden and report, he's fine, he's vigorous. The truth of the matter is, I read the 45-minute New Yorker story today, but I'm in a very, very 
infinitesimally small segment of the population that will read it in the first place. And there's zero, zero, zero people who will read that story in the New Yorker and be persuaded to change their vote. None. None. So, so re reality has to intrude into the D.C. bubble here at some point. And, and the one thing I know for sure, there's never been a moment in my adult lifetime, 30 years involved in national politics, where I talk to friends in Washington, I'm like, holy shit, you, I, you're, as, you're as attached to reality as what's going on in this country as, as if you were living on our lunar moon base. It, it's astonishing to me, people of both political parties. How so? What are they? What are they clueless about? Democrats are clueless in Washington about the hostility of working people towards the Democratic brand and to woke ideology. They detest it. They hate it. So people will talk about the plumber, the electrician, the working guy, and it's in their interest, right, to vote for a Democratic Party. And I'm like, how many welders and plumbers work at the DNC? How many plumbers and welders work in the DNC? Right? And, and the answer to the question is zero. There are, there are zero plumbers and welders that work at the at the DNC. There are many woke millennials with Ivy League degrees, which which is great, but disconnected profoundly from the mood of the country. What is what there is what a, are, what are and there, and there what, is a and there what, is a, and if you watch I say if you watch the cable shows, you watch MSNBC in particular. The the, the subject of his age, right? I mean, you know, one of the things that we all agree on in the country, once you get to the three quarter mark, right? Three out of four people in a room of a hundred, right? You worried about this? That's a big number, right? And there's a belligerence towards it. There's a belligerence towards the idea that it's not the best economy ever, right? I've never seen a kind of political commentary is so committed to yelling back at the electorate when the view of the electorate is expressed or manifested just through simple reporting on any forum. What do you think the Republicans are clueless about? You said both parties seem to be out of touch. What are they getting wrong about the mood of the country? Well, I, I think, well, I mean, I think that you have a significant enough percentage of Republicans that simply will not get on board with Donald Trump again, right, that is big enough to keep him out of office, but right? All, so, really? Because they seem to all be leaving or retiring. Well, I mean, it's not, I mean, someone's going to run for those offices, right? So... There's no person, let me, let me step back for a second. I, I am, there, there's no words to express my hostility to the notion that Mitch McConnell in his retirement is somehow an oppositional force towards Trump, towards MAGA, that the enmity that he and Donald Trump share for each other is somehow indicative of his resistance to the cancer that consumed his political party. Mitch McConnell's legacy is simple. It's a collaborationist. He allowed this to happen when he could have stopped it. And the fact of the matter is, is when Mitch McConnell joined the Senate, he was referred to as the world's greatest deliberative body. And, and today it's a farce, and he's the longest serving Senate leader in history. So Liz Cheney's gone, 
and Adam Kitzinger is gone. And all of the Republicans who voted to impeach Trump on a matter of conviction, they're all gone. So, so there are no Republicans, right, who, who have not gotten on board publicly with something they disdain privately, or, right, they're in the faction of the party that supports the Trump project in the MAGA movement at a spiritual level. Right, and that's Marjorie Taylor Greene and other blood and soil nationalists. But but the movement, what Trump is positing, right, it has a name. History defines it. This is what fascism is. That's what the movement is. It's what its ideology is. It's what it's what it's what he is positing, right, as a value. Right, he's a fascist agenda one of control, of subjugation that places the human being, the individual below the power of the state or the leader. That's what he believes in. And so the ability to communicate that, to frame it, right, to communicate to a 19-year-old woman what she has at stake at this, right, to a 25-year-old young black man what he has at stake in this, in a visceral, meaningful way, above the head and over the head of the deficiency of the leading candidate in opposition to the craziness, right, is a, is a, is a seminal political challenge in this cycle. And four years ago, it was achieved. It was achieved by 40,000 votes uh, across three states. And now the president carries the, the baggage of incumbency with him, so it becomes a harder task. And what do you what do you think of the latest New York Times Siena poll that showed Trump, what, five points ahead of Biden? Well, if the election were today, Trump would be elected. You know, the good news is the election is not today. It's in 245 days, which is, uh, which is a long time away. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, in all of our years, you know, being involved in, in politics, covering national politics, we have, we have never seen a year where where a candidate right has has steamrolled the nomination process like this he's won every state all of them right all of them and so so, so tonight clean sweep right and somebody who incited an insurrection lied thirty five thousand times right refuses to acknowledge he lost an election who's inciting Vladimir Putin to invade NATO territory and precipitate World War III is sweeping, right, the Republican contest with about 60% of the vote. And, and the question is, right, is how much of that balance of 40% is on the never line, right? And, and that, right, is the answer to the question in the end about, Who's going to win this election? What do you mean, forty percent of the you got, population? You got you got twenty eight to about forty percent of the election electorate, right? Is is voting against Trump, right? In the in the Republican primaries, right? right. Nikki Haley is their Nikki Haley is their vessel, right? Are they going to get online? Is that an emotionally satisfying? Well, you know, I've purged it, right? Like I voted against them, but like my choice is him or Biden, but so. Because I voted against them, now I got a clear conscience to vote for them, right? I mean, the human psyche is more complicated than it is is given credit for in the political coverage on some of this stuff. But the the, the most important question in the electorate is of that forty percent inside the Republican electorate, what is the number, right, that are hard nose on Trump? And that number in the voter electorate is higher than in the elected portion of the party in Congress or other places. You still have courage there. You still have principle in this portion of the electorate. And we'll, we'll see. Right? So, but that's going to determine Trump's future. And will you, are you saying the question is whether they will stay home and not for Trump, but not vote for Trump or go, go to the polls and vote for Biden? Some will. Some will stay home. Um, some will go vote for Biden. And and that mix, right, that alchemy, right, is gonna be is gonna be determinative. Two, it's gonna be determinative. Two quick questions.
questions before I let you go, yes. Steve. You're so nice to talk to me for this long. Somebody asked, uh, who follows me on social media, since you ran John McCain's campaign, I think you're a good person to answer this question. What do you think John McCain would think of his friend Lindsey Graham's actions? And, you know, we, anyway, I don't need to really elaborate on that. I, I we were trying, there were some of us, I mean, we, the, there's, the moment comes for all of us when we, when we make it up to the pearly gates. And if Lindsey Graham makes it up there, I suspect John McCain will be waiting to kick his ass. I mean, he will, he, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't even, right? It's just, he would just be shocked, 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 dismayed, sad, sick. I wanted to ask you about Nikki Haley. Obviously, she has pursued, uh, you know, a fight and 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 stayed in the race. What becomes of Nikki Haley? She's going to make a lot of money, serve on corporate boards, and do paid speaking. I mean, you know, she's. Do you think she's a potential candidate for for twenty twenty eight? No, I don't. Really, I don't. I, I I think Nikki Haley falls deeply in the category that John Kennedy talked about in his inaugural. Right, be beware of the foolish men, he said, but but it applies to foolish women as well. Right, so we'll update it. Be beware of the foolish men and women who seek power by trying to ride the back of the tiger, only to wind up inside. And and Nikki Haley is somebody who tried to ride the MAGA tiger for a good, 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 good long ways. And at the beginning of this race, she raised her hand and said at the end of this, no matter what, forevermore, I'll be supporting Donald Trump, which is where she'll end up. And when she does, all the intellectual inconsistencies and hypocrisies of the entire affair, which in the core is about her ambition, not about the country, no higher cause, no higher principle, no cause greater than self will be laid bare. And so I have a very cynical view of her. I was her, like, wow. Her, like, her actions is very, is very cynical. So I don't, I don't view her as a virtuous player in this, right? And that to me, when they raised their hands, was a defining moment in this. And real quick, someone asked, who do you think uh, Donald Trump's running mate will be? Oh, uh, God. Um, at least a panic. God help us. Why do you think that she doesn't do much for him geographically, really, does she? No, but he'll like him fighting for her. He'll like her fighting for him. He'll well, like Steve, her fierceness. So. It's really, really fun to talk to you. Good I mean, talk to you, Katie. I, I, I could talk. I could talk to you all night and, uh, you know, uh, I guess, I guess before we go, just to give people something to hold on to, what do you think needs to happen in those 245 days between now and the election? If you believe Trump should not be president, how, how, what can the average person do? You have to. You have to get involved. You have to get involved in the campaign, make phone calls, knock on doors, do something, give money, right? There's a thousand different ways to be involved, but you have to be involved and engaged in a civic life, right? In community, in your state, in your in your country, right? There's no there's no outs for it. At at the end of the day, if the only people right who participate in any of this stuff are certifiable. Right. We're going to be led by certifiable people. Right. So, you know, this is this is you have to be involved, have to be engaged. And and I just encourage everyone to do so. All right, Steve. Well, thanks, thanks again. Great to see you. Thanks and thanks for watching, everybody. Bye. Take care, Steve. Bye. You got it.